Welcome to the Reverse Alzheimer's Summit. I'm your host, Dr. Heather Sanderson, and I could not be more delighted and more privileged to welcome Dr. David Perlmutter today. He is a board certified neurologist and five time New York Times bestselling author. His books have been published in 32 languages and include the number one New York Times bestseller, Grain Brain. The Surprising Truth About Wheat, Carbs, and Sugar, with over a one million copies in print. He's also recognized internationally as a leader in the field of nutritional influences on neurological dis disorders, hence why we have him here today. He serves as a member of the editorial board for the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease and has published extensively in peer-reviewed scientific journals, including the Archives of Neurology, Neurosurgery, and the Journal of Applied Nutrition. Dr. Perlmutter is the host of a great podcast called The Emp Empowering Neurologist. I listen to every episode. I'm a huge fan. And also the video series, The Science of Prevention. He's been interviewed on many nationally syndicated television programs, including 2020, CNN, Fox News, The Today Show, Oprah, Dr. Oz, and many others. Dr. Perlmutter, thank you again for joining us. Welcome. I'm so delighted to be here. Thank you for having me. So we met in person briefly at a recent conference, and it was hard for me to pin you down because you kept taking off to go hiking, which I love. There is something really compelling about taking advice from someone who actually lives it. The things that you and I talk about, they're not always easy to implement, right? We're asking people to get more exercise and make better decisions around food and diet in the face of a culture that has sugar and alcohol and sitting on your butt, it's really easy to just do that, right? What do you think are the most important lifestyle choices that you make every day, or at least most days, right? <laughs> We're not all perfect. Well, I, I think it'd be great just to let your audience know that where you and I had that conversation was in the parking lot in uh, uh, the Venetian Hotel in Las Vegas, Nevada. So when you talk about alcohol and sugar and sitting on your butt all day, that, it, you know, what else could come to mind? And you're right. So we, we, my wife and I decided, and son, he visited as well, that we were going to get out of town and we went uh, hiking in, at Red Rock. So the point is, it's, it's really Im important. We are kind of inculcated with the notion that we should live our lives come what may. And then once things start to happen, there'll be a magic fix, no, no matter what it is. Yeah. You know, you cannot take care of yourself and ultimately have degeneration of your hip and you can get a new one or a knee or whatever, uh, but you can't really get a new brain. And it's really uh, so important that we realize there's nothing pharmaceutical available as you and I have this conversation right now. And we think back of what happened in February of uh, 2021 with this Aduhelm drug was, you know, it was the rave, but actually it didn't work. <laughs> So uh, we have nothing uh, in the pharmacopoeia to, uh, to treat this incredibly pervasive uh, situation called senile dementia of the Alzheimer's type, now affecting some 6 million Americans. Highly, uh, you know, it's 50% of people who are age 85 or older. So in that age group, it's, you, you couldn't call it an epidemic. It's way beyond epidemic. And yet no one talks about it. And no one talks about it until a loved one is involved uh, or, you know, or it's your choice of profession or in my case, both. Uh, so it, uh, you know, we, we have the data and we've had it for a couple of decades that lifestyle choices that you bring up are exceedingly valuable in choosing a more appropriate destiny for our cognitive function. And it's the mission then to get that information out to people uh, and you know that's that's why you and I are doing what we're doing today. It's because you know there are powerful um, there's powerful scientific research that supports exactly what it is that we will talk about. The idea that physical exercise can preserve the brain, uh, the idea that keeping blood sugar under control, reducing inflammation, reducing stress, getting a good night's sleep, uh, in involving a ketogenic diet from time to time. There's so many areas to explore, uh, and and yet you know, again, most people ask themselves, well, why bother? Well, you begin to wonder why you bother when you're faced with Alzheimer's for, or cognitive dif uh, dysfunction for yourself or your loved one, and then you wish you would have heard this information. So there's a lot to talk about, that's for sure. 
Yeah, there are so many people who are still told that there's nothing you can do for dementia. And yet there is so much that you can do that it can sometimes get a little overwhelming. And especially if you're in the, the position of being maybe the loved one or the child of someone with dementia, potentially there are genetic predispositions that you may have. At that conference, I heard you mention that you think almost 100% of dementia can be related to genetics. Can you explain how you got there? Yeah, that uh, and that raised a lot of eyebrows and I'm glad. I always, I la always like to do that. Um, you know, traditionally we have said about three to 5% of Alzheimer's may be genetic or have a strong genetic component. And that, you know, I think traditionally that's valid. We know that there are certain genes, presenilin gene, uh, the APOE uh, array, uh, ha have a, a role to play in terms of risk, no question. They predispose, they don't determine, they're not determinants. But through the lens of how we are currently challenging our highly refined genome that has served us well for millions of years, how we're suddenly challenging that genome and all of its downstream attributes with our current lifestyle, that's where I, uh, I make the statement that the, the issue relating uh, genome to Alzheimer's or diabetes or obesity or any of the chronic metabolic issues is this inappropriate relationship between our current environment and our evolution. In other words, what our genome wants to see or should see and what it's actually seeing based upon the lifestyle choices that we are making. And what I was speaking about, and, and you know, I've been speaking about this in terms of blood sugar for quite some time, but what I was speaking about at the conference that where we ran into each other was the idea that humans were put under environmental pressure, uh, actually primate, our primate ancestors long before they were humans, 14 to 17 million years ago with a time when the earth became cooler and there wasn't as much food available. And it was a very powerful selection uh, input, in other words, it tended to select those individuals who could make a little more body fat and who could raise their blood sugar just a little bit and might have even had a little bit more inflammation to help protect them against infection. Not a lot, but just enough that they were the ones who survived and the others perished. So whatever gene changes this group was experiencing would be passed on and ultimately, we've determined that one of the gene mutations that happened some 14 to 17 million years ago in our primate ancestors was uh, the gene array that deals with the formation of an enzyme called uricase that breaks down uric acid such that it became less functional, meaning that these ancestors had higher levels of uric acid. Now, most people have heard of uric acid in the context of gout, sure. But now we know that uric acid is a central player as it relates to our metabolism. That uric acid is playing a major role in our blood pressure control, our lipogenesis, how much fat we produce, how much fat we burn, our metabolic state, uh, even the production of new blood sugar called gluconeogenesis and insulin resistance are all highly influenced by our uric acid levels. Those of our ancestors who had slightly higher levels of uric acid survived and passed on to the next generation that mutation, the uricase gene. There are actually several of them mutations. And each human today walking the planet has that mutation such that we are predisposed to make more fat, to raise our blood sugar, to raise our blood pressure when we consume certain foods like fructose, fruit sugar. The consumption of fructose millions of years ago and continuing on to our Paleolithic ancestors allow them to survive. They'd find the berries in the fall, eat that level of fructose. They would make it through the winter when they couldn't find food. So it's been a wonderful adaptive uh, genetic scenario nowadays with the incredible change in our diets with much higher levels of fructose, higher levels of other chemicals that make uric acid like purines and higher levels of alcohol. Uh, we're making uric acid left, right, and center, and it's telling our bodies to make fat, make blood pressure higher, make blood sugar higher. And so in a very real sense, then, these metabolic diseases like cardiovascular disease and Alzheimer's and some forms of cancer, and certainly type 2 diabetes, 
represent a genetic issue. They relate back to these changes in the human genome that were for 99.9% .9 of our time, survival mechanisms. Now, when they are challenged by our current environment, they're leading to these metabolic issues, these chronic degenerative conditions that are ranked by the World Health Organization as the number one cause of death on our planet right now, not some kind of infection. It's actually the chronic degenerative conditions. Good news is, but these are related to our lifestyle choices and we can rein them in when we make better choices. And that's what you know the messaging is all about. That's really exciting that we have control over a lot of this. Um, it, I know that you get into this in the book, but I wanna give our listeners some of the kind of tangibles. What is the ideal range for uric acid and how frequently do you suggest testing that, especially if you're gonna make one of these lifestyle interventions? Can you start reversing this in 12 weeks? Can, can this be resolved? Oh, much sooner months? than that. You can, re, you can reverse your uric acid or begin to uh, institute change within days. That's the good news. One study actually <clears throat> in England looked at 22 young men who had slight elevation of uric acid and put them on either quercetin, 500 milligrams a day, or a placebo. And in two weeks, their uric acid levels came down 8%. That's, that's dramatic. So, uh, you know, when you couple to that, uh, quercetin, you couple to that lowering your fructose consumption, uh, making other dietary changes, you can really have an impact on uric acid very, very quickly. So I generally check my uric acid, not that frequently because it generally is remaining low. I check it at home with a, a uric acid monitor, happen to have it right here on my desk. And there it is. And my last level was whatever that says, 4.7. And so to answer your question about what it should be, when you go to the um, doctor's office and you have your uric acid level checked, the lab that it spits out will tell you that the normal range is seven or below. And I have a problem with that on two counts. First of all, um, I don't like normal range for my patients. Normal is lame. <laughs> I want optimal. I want tip top Tony. I want people to be really achieving uh, extraordinary health, not just average, which is what normal is, right? Uh, and the other thing is that number 7.0 was derived based on gout, based on risk for gout, and based upon the level of uric acid in the blood where it begins to form crystals, which is what gout is all about. Although, now we know that people who have elevated uric acid actually have crystals forming in their blood vessels, in their heart, and even in the prostate gland. So it, it's something beyond just your great toe, for example. So we're targeting a level of 5.5 uh, milligrams per deciliter or lower. That's the level below which uh, we begin to really have an impact on risk for cardiometabolic issues, risk for neurometabolic issues. I know that's not yet a term, but I'm going to throw it around and hope that it gains traction. Neurometabolic, you heard it first. And uh, so it's, a, it's certainly a lot lower than what was determined to be the cutoff in the past and gratefully so. You know, what I love about this as a provider is that it's so simple and cheap and easy. If a patient walks into my office, I mean, we can get this done through LabCorp or Quest. It's widely available, usually covered by insurance, very inexpensive. Um, and that, you know, as you know, I work closely with Dr. Bredesen and have been implementing this protocol, doing a lot of the, the testing, which is very, very extensive. And it's not accessible to everyone, but something as simple as uric acid that gives us so many insights into this neurometabolic state is, um, it, it's just doable, right? It, it's that simple ability to do it and, and take action and use that data to make some lifestyle changes and then get the feedback. That makes all the difference in the world. The feedback, especially. I mean, I am really, uh, very much enamored with the notion of having uh, data on myself and others uh, that allow them to know what is the effect uh, on my blood sugar today based upon the fact that I stayed up too late last night or I ate dinner too late or I didn't exercise and what's how uh, is my blood uh, uric acid level doing lately because I've had a little bit more whatever the food may be aged cheese for example whatever it may be. And uh, how did I sleep last night? Uh, what does my aura ring tell me? You know, it, how much heart rate variability am I having? What's my oxygenation 
Uh, what's my performance based on my Apple Watch? And all these things are really incredibly valuable. Uh, and there's certainly a, a, an, uh, a move amongst mainstream medicine to rein this in. Uh, there was an interesting editorial appearing in the Journal of the American Medical Association last year, really saying that if you're not diabetic, why would you want a continuous glucose monitor? You shouldn't have one. But my, my point would be, if you don't want to become diabetic, then you should have a continuous glucose monitor and you can figure it out right away. You'll learn real quickly what foods are particular for you that are raising your blood sugar or how your blood sugar might respond to the fact you didn't sleep well last night or you didn't exercise or you have a lot of stress. All these factors play into blood sugar long before the doctor says, oh, it's time to pop you on medication because you've got diabetes now. You know, it's not, diabetes is not like, being pregnant, you know, being pregnant is you either are or you're not. Diabetes is should be looked upon as a continuum from having normal blood uh, glucose, though the blood insulin level is now elevated, that's already getting to a situation that is paving the way for diabetes. The pancreas is working overtime, creating higher levels of, of insulin to bring the blood sugar back to normal. In that case, your blood sugar is not really that valuable in comparison to looking at the insulin level. So I'm all for people really knowing what's going on in their own bodies for crying out loud and being able to make these changes. You know, the argument was, oh, people are gonna become neurotic. When maybe that wouldn't hurt a little bit to become a little bit more involved in understanding your personal physiology. One of our favorite games to play at my office is the providers say, okay, if we had our levels app, testing cortisol for our patients and for ourselves and blood sugar and ketones. We just start adding this wish list of all the things that we would love to get real time information on. And certainly my experience with wearing a continuous glucose monitor, I changed my diet completely. I didn't realize how my blood sugar was spiking with my morning matcha. Um, and so I had to switch that up a little bit, but certainly the, personally, I've seen it. I've seen the benefits with my patients. And um, so I thank you for being, I think you're involved over there uh, with some continuous glucose monitors and having people like you suggesting that, that our patients take the reins, right? Like modern medicine isn't doing the trick. We're not getting healthier people. We're actually having a population that's less healthy. And we, if we can get the power and the information in the hands of people who can then respond to it and use it, we're going to get a healthier population. Right. And, and, and basically modern medicine is focusing on the smoke, not the fire. Right. Uh, I gave a lecture a couple of years ago to, um, I guess it was a group of uh, doctors uh, in a large uh, medical group up in New Jersey, I think there were 400 in the same, under the same umbrella. And I asked the audience, um, what is your go-to treatment for um, type two diabetes? And, you know, some that were, uh, you know, talking about this medication, you know, sulfonylureas, metformin, whatever it may be, that's the best thing we can be doing. And then I said, okay, great, great, great answers though I didn't believe it. <laughs> uh, but I said, what happens when you stop the medication? Uh, and uniformly, they said, well, the blood sugar is going to go up. And then I said, did you, did you really treat the underlying problem? Did you really treat the diabetes or just managed their blood sugar? They realized they weren't treating the problem. They were treating the manifestation. They were treating the, the smoke and not the fire. And then I presented the work of Dr. Sarah Hallberg using a ketogenic diet in, in diabetes and, and getting people off of their medications uh, and keeping them off their medications and allowing them to maintain normal insulin levels, normal blood sugar levels. That's treating the problem. That's putting the fire out and not just fanning away the, the smoke. Right. And, you know, you have a book called uh, Brain Wash, and a lot of what you're talking about there the pattern that comes up is that modern society doesn't really support the healthiest humans. Um, your current book is also called Drop Acid. So before I leave this, uh, what do you think about psychedelics as a neurologist? Because of the title Drop Acid? Yeah. Uh, I, and you were at the, uh, probably the same lecture that I was at at that last event, which was interestingly given by our son, uh, Austin Perlmutter, MD. And um, I think that as he well explained, uh, there is huge, huge potential here. And when we recognize historically what got in the way of this research and the clinical research, 
uh, and how that sidetracked us for 30 years at least. Uh, and now the pieces are being picked up. I think there's, there's really incredible potential to uh, reconnect us. Um, we wrote uh, Brainwash about this idea that we had called disconnection syndrome, whereby inflammation uh, brought upon by you know, the various metabolic things that you and I are talking about right now, inflammation tends to segregate our brain away from being able to tap into the prefrontal cortex and kind of locks us into more primitive uh, impulsivity type thinking, which is self-centered, not thinking about others, not thinking about the future, as opposed to being able to use this prefrontal cortex and bring the adult back in the room. And I think that one thing we see with meditation is that it tends to light up that prefrontal cortex and psychedelics as well. So uh, I think that uh, moving forward, we're gonna see that there'll be a lot of empowerment derived from the appropriate judicious use of specific psychedelics in certain circumstances. You know, uh, Austin talked about how various uh, psychedelics or things that are somewhat characterized as being psychedelics are proving useful in certain clinical uh, uh, issues. So I think we're gonna, we're right at the very beginning of, of understanding what, where clinically that can go. But I think overall, I'm very, very bullish on it, thinking it's gonna be a huge, uh, a positive way of really unwinding a lot of issues that people have with respect to brain functionality. Yeah, and with dementia in particular, that disconnection, that not having that social interaction can be, and then that leading to depression, anxiety, those are all risk factors for dementia. So using whatever tools we can to combat, and especially after a pandemic or going through a pandemic like the one that we are in right now with COVID, these, these things are all a, a bigger and bigger problem that we need to find solutions for. And so thinking outside the box, and especially hearing it from a neurologist that psychedelics might be something to delve deeper in, in terms of the science, and certainly doing that in a safe way with uh, somebody who's well-trained. Ketamine, it tends to be something, it's sort of in that category that's relatively accessible. Do you have any thoughts on ketamine in particular? Yeah, and again, uh, uh, talking about uh, ketamine, you know, one could argue the fact that, well, it's not really a, um, a hallucinatory psych, uh, psychedelic per se, but I think, you know, the data coming out with, uh, with uh, major depressive disorder uh, is really profound. I mean, far more successful than any uh, pharmaceutical intervention currently, you know, approved for use, SSRIs or, or other forms of, of uh, antidepressants. Uh, so I, I am very, very uh, excited about the role that ketamine might might have uh, in in that regard. But you know, there's a unifying feature I think amongst many of the things that you just mentioned, and it's inflammation, whether it's uh, uh, dementia or depression, anxiety, inflammation is always hanging around. And, you know, whatever it takes to rein inflammation may prove, um, may prove effective. I read an interesting article this morning proposing the use of helmets or small worms in eggs, giving eggs of small worms to people to help reduce neuroinflammation in that it may prove helpful with these particular issues that we've just talked about. So, you know, I think the bigger issues relate to, um, you know, diet and elevated blood sugar and obesity and changes in the gut bacteria and how those all play into augmenting this inflammatory cascade that seems to underlie many of these problems. What we described in Brainwash was this fundamental role of upregulation of inflammation, separating or disconnecting the term we used, the prefrontal cortex from having influence over the more impulsive short-sighted amygdala. So we can bring that connection back online. And I think, you know, that's the real mission that will then allow better decision-making, uh, thinking about the future instead of just today. Now we are, you know, given this notion that just do whatever you want and we'll fix it. And uh, we really need to bring that prefrontal cortex online and embrace the fact that the future is coming. And there is no treatment for Alzheimer's uh, from the pharmaceutical industry, and it's really up to us. So we really have to leverage that ability we have to embrace the, the idea that first, we are responsible, and uh, second, that we're choosing our cognitive destiny uh, in a very real way. 
Aging versus dementia. So is there some normal thing about cognitive decline as we age? Or do you think that people should be able to maintain and maybe even achieve higher levels of cognition as they get older? Uh, You know, I think dementia is a pathological state. There's nothing supportive, nothing good about dementia. There's no attribute about becoming dementia. So I think it's pathology. I think it's not just part of growing. It's just not old timers disease as it were, or, you know, acceptable uh, senior moments. There is no such thing as a senior moment in terms of writing away <clears throat> this notion that suddenly you don't remember your grandchildren's names. That's, that's clearly a uh, pathological. We are living longer than we ever had. Uh, that's for sure. And, you know, our bodies and brains, one and the same, uh, manifest the accumulation of various things over time that are not necessarily supportive of structural or functional continued uh, activity uh, that, that we, you know, compared to younger reproductive years. But there is an interesting um, idea uh, that, that the dementia that we have is characterized by kind of short-sighted uh, risk-taking, not leveraging prefrontal cortex cognitive function as much as it sh- as you should, as possibly being adaptive. And let me walk through this because it's a little bit, needs a little bit of unpacking. When the brain activates what's called the polyol pathway, so it's converting glucose into fructose, ultimately that leads to a situation of compromising functionality of, of various parts of the brain and reverts the brain to uh, what is called foraging activity, a situation whereby we act impulsively. We're not thinking about the future. We're just looking for food right now because the brain thinks the body is starving by virtue of the fact that the fructose level is higher. And that could have been a survival mechanism, obviously, to be in that foraging behavior. You know, it's more characteristic of of rodents in the laboratory setting when you give them higher levels of fructose, for example. But nonetheless, we know that the Alzheimer's brain is a brain that is characterized by much higher levels of fructose, as much as five-fold increased fructose produced within the brain. How do we know that? We know that because glucose to fructose has an intermediary called sorbitol. And sorbitol levels are very high in the Alzheimer's brain as well. So the fundamental here of Alzheimer's may be that it was, I hate to say designed, but was preserved as a way of enhancing foraging activity, limited activity, less thinking about things, less you know, being able to cogitate uh, as a survival mechanism. So uh, of course, in today's world, the, you know, the higher levels of fructose in the brain ultimately lead to things like insulin resistance, even higher levels of glucose, upregulation of uric acid production, therefore more inflammation. And as such, you know, our, our fundamental towards this notion of a, a bioenergetic defect or a defect in the way brain cells are able to utilize energy. Why? Because their mitochondria have been disrupted by the higher levels of uric acid and also by fructose metabolism, which is an energy consuming ATP to AMP activity that ultimately results in defective mitochondrial function, as does uric acid by its augmentation of free radicals, challenging the mitochondria. And what happens when mitochondria become um, not as functional? A couple of things happen. First of all, they uh, replicate those dysfunctional mitochondria, A and B. Mitochondrial dysfunction is sensed by the nuclear uh, DNA Uh, to trigger caspase enzymes that ultimately leads to pre-programmed cell death. So that defective mitochondria ultimately leads to neuronal death. So this is the downside consequence of this bioenergetic defect whereby brain cells are seen on these PET scans that look at glucose utilization that the brains of Alzheimer's patients show areas where glucose can't be utilized. Why? because those neurons have dysfunctional mitochondria and insulin isn't working as well as it should. Uh, And so, uh, you know, this gets back to the so-called bioenergetic 
defect that I think is very, very, very fundamental as it relates to Alzheimer's and can be bypassed by a ketogenic diet, as was recently demonstrated by Dr. Matthew Phillips, uh, demonstrating cognitive improvement in mild to moderate stage Alzheimer's patients on a ketogenic diet. And you can show that on brain imaging that looks at radionucleotide labeled acetoacetate versus glucose. You can show that whereas these areas are not utilizing glucose, they can utilize ketones really well. So they're functional, but not functioning to a certain extent. So it, it speaks to then mechanistically, um, you know, what has happened over millions of years, if you will, in terms of something being adaptive versus something uh, now in the face of our current environment uh, being threatening. Similar with respect to the APOE4 uh, predisposition for brain degeneration. Well, there must've been an upside or we wouldn't have perseverance of APOE4, 25% of our population carrying at least one allele. Why would it be there if it's always gonna make people demented and that wouldn't be a good thing? Well, why would it persevere? First, if it's going to cause dementia, generally that's past our reproductive years. So that's one explanation. But the other side is that it may confer upon us an increased level of inflammation, which traditionally was probably a good thing because it would help us fight infection against bacteria and parasites. We know uh, even now that there is a strong representation uh, of APOE4 being protective when parasites infest individuals in certain equatorial tropical regions and offering them protection against dementia, carrying the APOE4 allele when they have parasitic infections. So, you know, it's time to take a step back and really take a deep breath and look at all this information that we have and look at it in the context of all of these things possibly offering us a survival mechanism now in the form of these individuals living in these tropical areas, but certainly all of us historically when the world was much different. Right, right. I'm so glad you mentioned that keto study because what's happening, what you've described is that the fuel isn't being used efficiently in the brain. And so what can you do? You can switch the fuel. Right. And that can be, you get almost the opposite of this foraging response that you were describing where you're just thinking about right now, you just need to eat. In a ketogenic state, many people actually have mental clarity. They stop being hungry. Um, they're not as desperate for to find that sugar rush. And they are able to think more clearly, of course, and that they have less anxiety, they start to sleep better. So you see a lot of things resolve. Now, I wouldn't argue that people should be in ketosis forever, probably just as bad as burning sugar for fuel would be always burning fat for fuel, but some mix of going back and forth and getting the brain healing benefits. What, when I think about ancestral diets, what was consistent about them was inconsistency. Absolutely, flexibility. Flexibility, adaptability, uh, and this kind of goes to that hormetic effect, right? A, a little bit of stress on the system can actually increase our ability to respond to changes in the environment. And so wherever we can do that, we find that, that the brain responds to that. So with uh, calorie restriction or a fasting mimicking diet like the ketogenic diet, with hot and cold therapies, with the oxygen sometimes even, um, of course, in the right context in a, in a safe place, but there are ways that we can, exercise is a phenomenal example, like one of the best where we stress the system a little bit and then get this response that's so good for long-term health. That's right, but it all requires action. And mm -hmm. <clears throat> is here's the, the big div divide. Is my action going to the doctor and getting a prescription or is my action utilizing the very things that you are talking about today? And that's the great divide. And um, I think people need to come, up, come upon that intersection and ask themselves, you know, two roads diverged in the wood here. And by and large, it's a lot easier to say, I'm, I'm gonna continue to doing my, you know, live the life that I want. And it's my life, you know, I'm gonna choose my, to do the things I wanna do. And, then when the time comes and I'm having a problem, then I'm hoping that there's gonna be something out there for me. And uh, 
We see that play out quite a bit these days in terms of how people make certain decisions and do certain things. And then when they don't, they don't play out exactly right, uh, they're suddenly requiring um, you know, an, an intervention. So that said, um, in the context of, of Alzheimer's, you know, affecting now 6 million Americans for which there is no treatment, yet we know that lifestyle choices are powerful levers to pull. Uh, in terms of reducing your, a person's risk for an incurable situation. I think we need to present it like that. We need to, to let people know this is an incurable situation. It's a one-way street, but you don't have to go down that street. Well, and, and I would I would beg to differ a little bit because I'm seeing dementia reversed in my office regularly. No, I, I'm talking about from a pharmaceutical perspective. So the pharmaceutical there is no pharmaceutical fix. Now, to be sure, I mean, we talked about the work of Matthew Phillips. We can certainly talk about the work of Dr. Dale Bredesen. Uh, if we get away from this model of a pill uh, or perhaps two pills and recognize that in each individual, we can identify areas that may be contributing to this brain decline and remedy those if people are willing, then absolutely. I mean, um, uh, you know, Dr. Bredesen wrote a book about that recently, you know, the, the people that he's reversed, I wrote the forward to it, as a matter of fact, uh, that he's reversing dementia in, and, and you know, I, I wrote the forward saying that this is landmark. I mean, it really, it's incredible. If I were on the Nobel Prize Committee, his name would be right there on the table because it, it, he's, he's done it. He has done it with a totally different paradigm that doesn't hope uh, put hopes in a billion dollar, multi-billion dollar blockbuster drug that's going to give shareholders a great return on their investment, but rather leveraging as many as 36 different endpoints uh, that can, or in, influxes that can have an, an impact on changing what may be askew in the brain. It's a tough concept to, to, to get people to get their arms around, but your point is certainly well taken that it is happening. Uh, maybe the ketogenic diet is not for everyone, and I don't think that it is. I think in individuals whose brain metabolism might be normal, or can we fingerprint people based upon their glucose scan versus their keto scan uh, and determine who then would, would best benefit from a ketogenic diet? But we need to also look at the other inputs. Are there infections going on? Is there chronic Lyme disease? What's the blood sugar? What's insulin sensitivity looking like? What is the uric acid level? You know, all of these things are extremely valuable in and of themselves. They might be playing the lion's share of role here uh, as it relates to that particular person's individual um, issue. You know, I, I, I think of the, the person who says, doctor, my feet are hurting. I walked five miles a day and look at the blisters I have. And my response is, well, you're wearing shoes. And he says, no. And so I give him some shoes. And the next time he comes back, he has blisters again. And uh, I said, well, why didn't you wear the shoes? He said, well, I have a size 10 uh, foot. And you gave me a size six shoe. And uh, he, 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 of course, it didn't fit him. And, uh, I, and my response is, well, most people, that's the size most people wear. So that's really your problem. So that, that's what we're trying to do, though, with Alzheimer's. We're trying to put everybody into one size shoe. And as Dr. Bredesen made very clear, uh, people have different requirements, different needs in terms of uh, first identifying what's going on in their particular situation and then providing that suite of remedies. So one of the very you know, appropriate criticisms of Dr. Bredesen's approach, what I do every day in my office, um, is that there's not enough research. You are very research driven. And one of the things I appreciate so much about you is that when the data changes, you change your mind, right? Which is what any rational person should do. And I get um, criticized for it, but that's okay. <laughs> well, I am, I'm here to tell you how much I appreciate it. And so when the data changes, hopefully it, there will be a groundswell of support for this from, from neurology offices, from primary care offices, where they will say, hey, there is something you can do. It's not just Aricept and Amenda. There is a lifestyle that you can choose to follow, and you may get benefits from it. And not just with dementia, but hey, your hemoglobin A1C is going to get better. That gout may go away. You're going to see resolution often of blood pressure. Um, and so what do you think would be the research? What is the paper that you would need to see or read 
what what is the study? What would be the design of the study that would make you fully convinced that this is a reverse? I'm going to have to tell you that I I'm um, I'm embargoed from answering that question right now. I will say that it's 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 been written, uh, and I I'm going to have to leave it at that. There are a number of things that I do uh, that uh, I'm going to have to. Uh, uh, I would just say be confident. I can't really take it further than that right now, uh, but you know, unfortunately, uh, the research has already happened. Books have been written, and it, you know, it's so frustrating that it doesn't seem to move the needle because you know, the mainstream doctors are told, you, "This is the pill. We're gonna, and if it doesn't work, hang on, we got a new one coming down the pipeline." You know, Pfizer abandoned uh, medication research for Alzheimer's because it wasn't, they just weren't finding anything. They were losing, you know, millions and millions of dollars. So, um, uh, you know, what Dr. Bredesen has come up with is a different, a totally different paradigm. I think coming up against mainstream medicine and specifically mainstream neurology is, is very, very compelling and very challenging. And I, I, I would hope that uh, this would rise to the top and people would pay attention to it, but um, I, you know, hope is not a strategy. Uh, and I don't know what the, the right strategy is. I mean, I've talked to this, uh, about this topic with Dr. Bredesen on any number of occasions. And we've said, yeah, you know, publish the research. We got to write a book. Uh, and now he's on his fourth book, I guess. Um, and uh, it, it's happening that he's doing these things, but uh, it's very frustrating because he's getting the results that nobody else is getting. And yet uh, it's so challenging to get people to pay attention to that. And here is a guy whose heart and soul in this, you know, he dedicates every ounce of his energy to this whole uh, idea of a multifaceted approach in terms of identifying causality and then rectifying whatever is askew. Uh, and and uh, you know you, you couldn't ask for a, a, a more dedicated individual in your corner, and yet um, you know I, I think he's making progress. I think more and more people through uh, the work of uh, of other doctors who are using his protocol, like yourself, who are following the protocol. I think that's certainly helping a lot. You know, percentage-wise, it's not a huge number as it relates to Alzheimer's patients, who by and large are going to take the Aricept and the Nemenda or nothing, uh, hopefully, and. Um, it, but, you know, we got to stay with it. it uh, I want to stop you there. You said Aricep, Nemenda, or nothing, hopefully. Tell yep. us a little bit about why you would prefer a patient take neither. Well, research shows that neither is the best choice, that these drugs don't work. They're associated with side effects. And publishing in uh, JAMA Network several years ago, Richard Kennedy uh, indicated in looking at uh, you know a fairly large number of individuals that those pa uh, individuals taking at least uh, the cholinesterase inhibitor Aricept uh, actually demonstrated a more rapid decline cognitively than those who did not. Here's a drug being given to Alzheimer's patients to slow down their cognitive decline, and lo and behold, they decline more rapidly. And yet, it's still okay to write prescriptions for this drug. I uh, I would say, don't get me started, but you are, I'm started. That's for sure. Well, you, but you I know what? Uh, just offer, I have seen patients who have started on those drugs and then when they come off of them, when they try to come off of them, they get precipitously worse and it's been no hard question, to recover no question, from. I mean, what so happens I, when you, you know, when you're working at the NDA receptor or you're inhibiting uh, cholinesterase and therefore building up uh, acetylcholine, what happens when you stop that? I mean, uh, you know, there's rebound effects and it's been well described. And don't think that uh, the manufacturers don't know that because, you know, people say, hey, well, we'll stop the medication, see what happens, bingo, people get worse. So, you know, I, I, I don't see the sense in using them. That's my opinion, I can back it up. But I, I wanna, you know, I wanna look at the glass being half full and focus on these ideas that we really are getting our arms around these fundamental mechanisms that are leading to brain functionality decline. And now that they're being addressed, whether they're infection, uh, toxic, metabolic, um, degenerative in, in, in terms of being related to other degenerative conditions, what they may be and identifying them and then remedying those underlying problems and seeing the results that Dr. Bredesen is, is describing, that is to me the glass half full the glass is really almost pouring out the top 
it's such common sense, right? This, this paradigm that instead of naming a disease based on what the symptoms look like, you start to ask the question, why? Why did this happen? And you even mentioned inflammation as one of the potential causes. And I want to just push back a little bit on that because I think of inflammation as downstream. That's oh, I, I, I agree with you. There's it's mechanistically else. very important, but I think it's clearly downstream from many of the uh, upstream mechanisms, including metabolic dysfunction, possibly even infection. I mean, the notion of infection being related to Alzheimer's has been around for a, a long time. I think Dr. Ruth Itzaki's Ruth work in, at Cambridge was published 25 years ago, identifying one particular organism, herpes simplex virus type one, uh, being co-localized to beta amyloid and inducing an inflammatory response. But I think the biggest player uh, uh, clearly in our modern world in terms of inflammation has to do with our glucose insulin uh, dysregulation model. And you know that is so catawampus these days, and it's downstream issues that further augment inflammation, like obesity and uh, disruptions of the microbiome, leading to gut permeability and upregulation of, uh, of LPS transgression across the bowel lining, and therefore you know even higher levels of inflammation. But I agree, it's a downstream issue, and I think to approach it appropriately, we have to look at those upstream issues like uric acid, like blood sugar, like fasting insulin levels, not necessarily glucose levels. You know, more tangentially looking at uh, A1C, at body mass index, all of these things that clearly, pun intended, feed into uh, inflammation, which ultimately, you know, the brain becomes, uh, the brain is inflamed, it's on fire. That's the meaning of the term. And then the downstream effects of that being uh, things like upregulation of free radical production, compromised uh, mitochondrial function, and ultimately this energetic issue. I want to talk a little bit about Green Brain. You published this originally in 2013. It's been what? It's coming at some point. It'll be a decade next year. And that's right. Like you, like we've already talked about, as the data changes, you change your mind. So you've made updates to this. And I'm curious, it, I mean, in 2013, you were one of the first people saying that even if you didn't have celiac, you may wanna consider getting away from gluten because of this downstream effect of inflammation, leaky gut. And there, I'm sure you got a lot of criticism and pushback, I can only imagine. And you've been proven- <laughs> Which is a good thing. Right. I, you know, if, there, if you're putting things out and there's no pushback whatsoever, then you're, you're at status quo. If everybody says, yeah, I got it, old news then you're not helping to move the ball down the field. Well, you certainly did, and you continue to. I know that the updates in the latest edition include things like the microbiome that you started to talk about. So I wanna understand with your uh, just assessment of the literature, where things are right now, what is the best diet for our brains? Mm. Uh, and I, I would tell you, it depends on who you're, who is your patient. So, you know, it's often been said that, uh, it's more important to know the patient who has the disease rather than the disease the patient has. So I think, you know, we are now in the time of personalized medicine. And I, I think it's not appropriate to be very specific about a dietary recommendation per se for any individual, but I think we should have dietary goals. What are those goals? Our goal should be to uh, make sure this is a diet that's going to be really effective in helping keep blood sugar normalized, that's going to keep down inflammation, that's going to provide the suite of uh, micronutrients that we know are important and will certainly nurture the gut bacteria as well. Now, might that be different based upon your unique polymorphisms in terms of how you uh, produce uh, B vitamins or how you uh, are able to uh, detoxify a certain toxins to which you are exposed and therefore you as an individual might need upregulation of certain pathways, might you then want to concentrate more on cruciferous vegetables or et cetera? You know, that's where the personalization comes into play. But I think the fundamentals are those goals. We want insulin sensitivity to be improved and then maintained. We want to nurture the widest array of, of gut bacteria. We want to reduce gut permeability. Uh, we want to be sure that we are not creating a situation where we're actually enhancing in the brain fructose production through the polyol pathway. We don't want to increase fructose production anywhere in the body. So our goals of reducing inflammation, reducing a free radical mediated stress, et cetera, are the endpoints and how we get there. 
can be through multiple roads leading to Rome. In other words, um, again, uh, what works best for you? And that's where the notion of wearable devices, continuous glucose monitoring, et cetera, comes into play, because then I'll know what Heather may need uh, in terms of her specific uh, diet that might well be different from what I might need. Right, right. And what, what were some of the things that have surprised you over the past 10 years um, as you've kind of dug deep into this? Have you, what, are, what are some of those tenants that you sort of let go of and, um, and are now using? Well, I've never admitted this before, but I will right now. And that is, I was more taken by uh, the, the, the role of our gut bacteria in terms of overall health and certainly brain health. Uh, that was more uh, of a revelation to me than the notion that gluten can have a neurological, in some people can cause neurological manifestations. You know, that was simply reading research, you know, primarily a, a researcher in, uh, at Oxford, Marios Ajavasalu, who started publishing this stuff. And I thought it was really interesting. I started getting results in my practice by reducing gluten in patients' diets and their headaches would improve, et cetera. But the microbiome relationship, no one was talking about. And, you know, it, it, to me, it kind of stood to reason. If glucose, dysreg uh, uh, glucose homeostasis and inflammation were sort of cardinal players in brain degeneration, then making the leap to the role of disturbances of the gut bacteria in those two parameters. But at that point, people were starting to realize that changes in the gut bacteria could predispose to type 2 diabetes. And even that things like fecal microbial transplants could help with type 2 diabetes. Whoa, if it'll help with type 2 diabetes, then there may well be something going on in the gut that relates to the brain. So that was the bigger leap for me. Wow. Uh, over the years, uh, I think that some of the things that have changed for me before grain brain, well before grain brain, uh, was the, the, the adoption of uh, recommendation for more levels, higher levels of fat in the diet. You know, 25 years ago, I was sort of parroting the, the standard discussion of low fat diet being a good diet. And I realized, you know, we all realized where that actually came from and how, what a disservice that was for those of us practicing uh, clinical medicine or nutritional counseling, you name it. Uh, so that was a big shift for me. That was prior to grain brain, uh, that's for sure. Uh, so the diet moving forward with time has become much more plant-based. Um, and there's still room for meat in my diet, but much more plant-based because I, I've realized that a dietary fiber is so underrepresented in, in, our, in our modern world uh, and is yet fundamentally so important to nurture our gut bacteria so they can help resolve inflammation. They can help with production of appropriate neurotransmitters, appropriate B vitamins. We can help produce serotonin by down-regulating pathways that take tryptophan away from serotonin, the kinuretic pathway. So many different things that our gut bacteria do, they, you know, actually are involved in changing gene expression for crying out loud. So yeah, that, um, I was just going to ask you exactly that question, like in a nutshell or, or in the most succinct way possible, what is the gut brain connection? And you already mentioned neurotransmitter balance and genetic transcription. Can you sort of synthesize for us? I think we hear that term. It's very trendy, gut brain connection, gut brain connection. But like, what does that mean? Well, I, I would say, uh, frankly, that we shouldn't be even having this discussion, that w w they should never have been segregated. Right. When did that all begin? You know, with Descartes and the idea that, well, we have, uh, you know, we have the bellows, which are the lungs, and we have the pump, that's the heart, and there are these inde independent parts that, uh, you know, ultimately come together, form the body. That's never how the human body was looked upon prior to Descartes. You know, we, it's always been looked upon as sort of a unified whole, and dare I say, holist, a holistic perspective. So the notion that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to defend that there's a relationship between the gut and the brain, which, you know, I'm not being, uh, you know, that's something I have to, I've done countless times. Uh, I, so there are multiple levels by which they are connected, but ultimately they're all part of the same. 
uh, that everything is, is responding to the same influences, that the gut represents a powerful, this is a great place to start, a powerful way of informing the brain as to the external environment. That's really one of the most important things that the gut does. It informs the brain as to what's going on in the outside world in terms of the environment, in terms of food availability, in terms of uh, even uh, water availability, in terms of threats, for example. Um, but, you know, there are physical connections, of course. Uh, there are immunological connections that are profound. There are chemical connections that we're just beginning to understand. Uh, in terms of things produced in the gut that directly moment to moment, to moment influence brain uh, functionality. There are relationships and mechanisms as we talked about earlier, like inflammation and glucose homeostasis that are profoundly influential in terms of brain health and uh, functionality. And there are um, top-down issues uh, as well related to the gut from the brain. Again, physical as well as chemical, hormonal. Uh, so the, the relationships are are multifaceted and are, you know, are seen at multiple levels. So, uh, you know, it, it, to me, why should it be a surprise that it's now, as you say, trendy to, to conceive that the gut is somehow involved and in, in influences the brain? It's only been the past couple hundred years that they were segregated. And uh, it's now time to, you know, really recognize that we, our entire bodies are functioning uh, as a, a continue with just continuity between all seemingly disparate parts. And this is where that Bredesen paradigm shift around dementia may, starts to make a lot more sense, right? In that idea that we're putting the body back together and myself as a naturopath, you know, that's the way I've been trained. So I sort of take it for granted. We have to put the body back together, the person back together, that person. Reintegrate. Reintegration. Yeah, exactly. Right. And that that even though many people end up with the same diagnosis, you know, we like this from an ICD-10 perspective, from an insurance perspective that fits the model. But when we can set that aside and say, okay, how did you arrive at this imbalance? What are the things we need to offer to the cells, to the body, to the system to help optimize function? Well, then we can change the conversation from talking to Dale Bredesen to talking to somebody like David Sinclair, where we're saying, okay, how do we live to be 150 and really have these fabulously wonderful lives where we get to show up at our great grandchildren's college graduations and be part of, of really just enjoying our elder years and and contributing in our elderly years that that wisdom and experience is so valuable not only for one family but for society as a whole and so when we have people with sharp clear minds who are able to show up at work or at church or at family gatherings that we there's so much we're throwing away when that's not happening and yet it's all possible today it is, uh, and it, it really is. And uh, if you want to blame somebody, you can blame me for for not being as totally effective as I could be, and, and blame Dale Bredesen because we can't get the word out, and we're trying. Some that's people why we're listen, here. but you know that's the issue: is that we are up against incredibly powerful forces that would have us believe that Alzheimer's is simply a loss of acetylcholine in the brain, the colon, acetylcholine hypothesis, uh, the cholinergic hypothesis, and that if we can put the acetylcholine back, then everything's going to be just Jim Dandy. Or, or take the amyloid plaque out. Or, or, amyloid, or Alzheimer's is simply the accumulation of beta amyloid in the brain. We, if we can keep it from happening or take it away, problem solved. And that's the, the narrative that, is, that makes its way certainly to the general population, but much more importantly is what doctors are being uh, told in their journals, uh, at their meetings, and then through the advertisements for the drugs that target those specific activities. It's, it's hard to go up against that because, you know, truthfully, doctors want uh, to practice medicine within a 15 minute window that you've got, you name the problem, and then you have a pill. And as it relates to neurology, oftentimes it's diagnosed and adios because there is no pill. But you know, in other specialties, it's, oh, you have high blood pressure, here's your blood pressure pill, see you later. You have, uh, you know, um, you have diabetes, here's the drug, take the drug. And as long as you take that drug and keep filling that prescription year after year after year until you die, we will accomplish our task, which is getting your blood sugar under control. No. 
That is not the task. That's not the challenge. The challenge is to treat the diabetes, to treat the fire and not just the smoke. And we know, Dr. Sarah Hallberg has shown us that you could put diabetics on a ketogenic diet and they can come off their drugs and not ever need them again. That's treating the fire, not just the smoke. It's, it's a tough road, uh, but you know, we're still uh, in the batter's box and we're gonna keep swinging as long as there's, there's something to hit. And once in a while we, we hit. And you know, in, in my life, for example, you, you said a, a lot of people have read Grain Brain. How many will act upon what we wrote about? Not everyone, that's for sure, but a, a percentage of people have read it and a smaller percentage of them will act upon it. But you know what? If one family can be spared, the agony of Alzheimer's that I went through with my father, then it's worth it. At the end of the day, at the end of my life, it's worth it. Well, I agree with you completely. Alzheimer's is optional. There are things that we can do today to prevent it for the vast majority of people. And if we can spare one family from the torture that is dementia, then it's worth showing up. Thank you so much for showing up here today. Uh, for lending your time and expertise to this and for inspiring um, all of our listeners who are joining us. Thank you for having me. And uh, I, I sure appreciate the opportunity. And my, my hope is that, um, you know, there's something here that people can hang their hat on just as a way of just opening uh, a little part of your mind that there may be another way out there. And that, frankly, uh, we are each involved in choosing our brain's destiny. It's not up you know, it's not something we can outsource. I'm certainly inspired by the sheer volume of phone calls that we get both at my clinic and at Marama, the residential care facility, and um, how many, it, usually it's a daughter, but they they come in enthusiastic and ready to get started. And, and um, really, the, I'm inspired, not just the caregivers, but the patients who are the pioneers in this space, who are, are showing us what's possible. It's incredible. That's right. Thank you. 